Empire. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Last Man Standing podcast. Yes, I'm your host, Ben Standing, and I cover the Washington Commanders for The Athletic. It is Thursday early evening here. The sun is very much out in Ashburn. In fact, I just looked out the window and blinded myself, so that wasn't smart. I um, hope everybody is doing better than I just did by looking out the window. Um, we've got a bunch to discuss. Uh, part two of my conversation with Commander's Analyst Logan Paulson. Part one, if you missed it, uh, was all about the offense. Part two, yes, not surprisingly, about the defense. You know, specifically, what did we learn about what Joe Witt Jr. is looking to do? Uh, or what he showed, I guess I should say, in the opener against the Buccaneers? Uh, what 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 did uh, Logan think of the pass rush, uh, the secondary, and more. So we'll get to all that in a few moments. And we've got some news specifically about one of the commanders, a young players uh, that is uh, not great for week two here and perhaps a few more weeks beyond that. We'll get to all that in a moment uh, on the Last Man Standing podcast. Of course, subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, yada, yada, yada. Also, check out my work on The Athletic. Uh, I'll have a new story up today about uh, what Cliff Kingsbury and Joe Witt Jr. had to say themselves about the week one performance and heading into week two against Daniel Jones and the Giants. Uh, of course, follow me on X or Twitter at Ben Standig. Uh, and uh, yeah, okay, so we got enough of that. You guys know the drill there. All right, let's get to this. The news of the day, kind of out of left field, sort of, is that cornerback Emmanuel Forbes under is going to undergo surgery on his right thumb uh he heard it in the tampa bay game he we saw him go have x-rays after the game on wednesday dan quinn suggested that it was relatively minor that it wasn't a big deal that it sounded like he wouldn't miss any time other than he would have to wear a splint out in practice. He did practice in full on Wednesday. However, before we even got Thursday's injury report, we got word that Forbes would be undergoing surgery on Friday. He was officially listed as limited today. I don't know if that officially means that he had any kind of a setback during practice. Perhaps uh, I, I would venture to guess it may have just been a simple pain issue as well but whatever it was they've decided to undergo surgery we don't have a time frame yet for his return if you know if it's four weeks or more he may very likely land on injured reserve meaning he would miss at least four weeks otherwise if they think it's less time then he could stick around this would presumably bump up mike davis who uh higher into the rotation after he you know, somewhat surprisingly, didn't take a defensive snap in the opener. Uh, Noah Igbenagahi, who was essentially the fourth cornerback, well, not essentially, he was the fourth cornerback, uh, you know, he's been typically viewed as another slot option. I don't know that they want to necessarily throw Mikey Sanders still outside, so Davis could go from, I, I think, possibly not playing to starting, or I should say he's not playing on defense, he was on special teams, to starting, perhaps they bring up Uh, a cornerback off of the practice squad. They have two there, including uh, uh, Chig Anusium, the undrafted free agent out of Colorado State, who got a lot of attention uh, this summer. Either way, no Emmanuel Forbes, presumably at least for this week and beyond. I say presumably because he hasn't had surgery. Until it happens, I can't say for sure. The team has not offered any type of guidance on that. So, you know, but likely he's not going to play on Friday. We'll hear from Dan Quinn on Friday and hopefully have a better feel at that point what the sense is for Forbes. So look, obviously Forbes has had tough times since arriving here in Washington last year as a first round pick, but nonetheless, he started this past game. He's one of their, you know, he's one of their high rotation guys. And this season, you know, you guys have heard me say this a hundred times now, 
But this season is in many ways about the staff trying to figure out who they have on this team. What can they do? You know, Washington was the one that drafted Forbes, but they weren't the only ones who thought he was worthy of being picked in the first round. I'd always heard that the Ravens would have taken him if he had been there for them uh, a few picks later. In any event, Forbes is at a tough time. He had his struggles against Tampa Bay. He was hardly alone, but nonetheless, um, he did. And uh, now we'll see when is he able to come back. You know, Forbes in that game was taken out twice. And I didn't think it was a bad performance. I think that was a lot of the speculation. I didn't necessarily think it was about that. But nonetheless, um, now we have a better feel as to why that may have taken place. So Emmanuel Forbes down. Washington will have to figure out a new rotation going up against the Giants. Of course, the Giants have their own problems. Daniel Jones had a mess of a game in their 28-6 loss to the Vikings. And today, their first-round pick, wide receiver Malik Babers, of course, Jade Daniels' top target at LSU, he landed on the injury report with a knee issue uh, listed as limited. So don't know if that's just a precaution or leading to something more significant, but we will see on Friday what uh, the injury report shows there. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, Cliff Kingsbury and Joe Witt spoke a bit today. And just a couple, qu- couple quick headlines here. One, I think a lot of us were wondering, or at least I'll say for me, I wasn't wondering about the, the totality of Jaden Daniels' rush attempts, officially 16 carries, but you know, it was obvious watching at least half, you know, give or take half of them, were Daniels just sort of t- taking off on his own. And, and Kingsbury noted it's reasonable to think that a rookie in his first game is going to have a fight or flight uh, vibe to him, especially when he faced more blitzes than any, co- or no quarterback in the league, I should say, faced more blitzes than Daniels is 15. In that game, ironically, Baker Mayfield also faced 15 uh, in the game of Washington blitzing him that much. So uh, Kingsbury had some interesting thoughts about kind of his own role in Jaden's performance. You can read that on The Athletic. As for Joe Witt Jr., he was pretty direct about how he felt with this group. You know, look, he said when it came to the uh, miscommunication problems in the secondary and... Um, missed tackles. He said in both cases, you know, there's a standard and they didn't meet the standard. Uh, he didn't put the blame with the miscommunication on anybody in particular. He said he's got to do better himself with helping uh, coach that up. But nonetheless, that was an issue. And you could see that happen throughout the game. I mean, Mayfield missed a few, uh, a few targets early on, or the game could have gotten out of hand a bit sooner. Uh, nonetheless, those are some of the takeaways Uh, that they had Um, one other injury well two other injury notes I guess one Johnny Newton was a a limited performer today in practice I guess we'll see if he's out there tomorrow maybe that suggests he does make his debut but he hasn't played in so long you would like to think at least I would like to think that they would prefer him practicing several days in a row rather than just sort of uh, sending him out there quickly so uh, we'll see how that goes and as far as Noah Brown you know Dan Quinn yesterday on Wednesday said that Noah Brown I asked him hey I presume right that Noah Brown was out the first game because he just had just only gotten here a few days prior and Dan Quinn said yes today I asked Cliff Kingsbury a little something about Noah Brown and he stated that in addition to catching up with the playbook that Noah Brown was dealing with something of an injury now the team later clarified that and said no, it was no no injury issue. It was just the fact that Brown, you know, was new and getting acclimated. Um, he also was not on the injury report and hasn't been since. All that said, Noah Brown did miss all four of Houston's preseason games. Yes, they had the Hall of Fame games, but four games, and he with a shoulder injury, or at least he'd been battling a shoulder injury. Uh, you know, so it wasn't like he was out all summer with that, but that was something that was in play for them and part of the reason why Houston moved on. So I I don't want to say we'll see him, Noah Brown, on on the field this week. But I do think, assuming he's healthy, that once he's able to get out there, he may quickly emerge as a high-rotation player. Um, Now, again, don't get crazy here into thinking this is some solution. It is not. 
I think on a, on a, on a regular team, you're talking about a guy who's a fourth receiver, maybe a third, depending on what else is available. But for this group, he gives you a bigger option as a blocker than Deami Brown, who is willing blocker, but Noah Brown outweighs him by 40 pounds. That's a better option, needless to say, in that scenario. He's also got some playmaking abilities. I, I talked to Terry McLaurin for a little bit. Uh, they, they both arrived at Ohio State in the same year. And, and, you know, Terry said, hey, look, he's not a guy with, like, crazy speed. But we saw last year with Houston that, you know, he can make plays down the field and that that aggressive blocking aspect will be a big help. So we will see if Noah Brown is able to go this week for Washington against the Giants. Um, you can follow me, you know, as I said, follow me on, on uh, Twitter at Ben Standing and to, uh, Friday or Saturday I'll have any updates with regard to the lineup. So that's where we are here. Um, again, if you've missed any of the episodes this week, along with my own recap of the, the game from Tampa Bay, I talked to our Giants reporter Dan Duggan this week, talked to Logan Paulson about the offense. And now Logan and I are going to get into the defense. In addition, I threw out some sort of like fact or fiction questions to Logan about the team overall, uh, including one involving Luke McCaffrey's uh, role here with this team. So we'll get to that right now here on the Last Man Standing podcast. Hey everyone, Bram Weinstein here, play-by-play voice of the Commanders and founder of Empire Media. And we are so excited that Ben Standing has come along and joined us with Empire with his awesome podcast, Last Man Standing. I wanted to tell you about our two other primary shows and selfishly mine, the Bram Weinstein Show, which can be heard on ESPN 630 in DC from 11 to 12, but then becomes a podcast that goes up immediately at 12 o'clock, five days a week, some of the best commanders and DC sports coverage you're going to get. So if you love Ben's show, check out mine as well. And also don't forget to check out the John Keim report from Empire Media as well, the ESPN Insider. We are bringing you the best commanders coverage all season long. Be sure to subscribe to all three of our Empire shows, Last Man Standing, The Bram Weinstein Show, and The John Keim Report. By the way, I forgot to say, I, I, I purposely brought this coffee cup out for you. I feel like if you were back in the day, you'd have been like a, a, an OK Corral kind of a guy. Dude, I love that movie. I mean, Val Kilmer, you can take whatever, you can, you can point to any Shakespearean actors you want. Top 10 acting performance in any movie ever. He was excellent in that movie. Excellent. Even what's his name? Kurt Russell's pretty good in that. And what's his name? Uh, the brother with the mustache who plays the same guy in every movie. Sam like, Elliott. You know, like the older but Yeah, he's a beast, dude. Love that guy. I just, on the flight back from Tampa, um, I couldn't commit to anything new. So I was watching The Big Lebowski for the 800th time. And even in that movie, he just <laughs> randomly comes in. It's like it's like he got lost on some yeah. other set. Just randomly comes in and it's being that guy. It's like, <laughs> well, what's going on here? Um Dude, Big Lebowski, excellent movie. Anyway, yeah. Oh, so um, excellent. Um, yeah, we 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 you know we, I you know we can do a whole podcast and just talk about movies. I'm uh, I'm down for that. Um, <laughs> by the way, before actually we get to the defense, I do want to ask you because I haven't talked to you uh, on here about this. The Jahan Dotson trade itself, I think for a lot of people they were confused. Like, wait a minute, the first round pick, recent first round pick, they don't have as we're saying they don't have a ton of receiving talent. Uh, but I kind of looked at it as th- they are trying to set an identity for what they're doing, and he just is a little more not saying it's right or wrong, but he's just a little more passive in his game. And they want guys who are going to be more aggressive, i.e. like even De'Ami Brown blocking and they bring in a Noah Brown type. Is that, was that your read ultimately on, on sort of what happened here? Or do you think there was other reasons why they decided, Hey, we just, we're just going to move on. Yeah. I think they've been very clear about what they want from everybody on the team in terms of their, you know, in terms of we want guys that are competitive, tough, urgent, and we're going to take coaching well. And I just, and again, like, I think Jahan's a really good dude. Talked to him a bunch, like very nice, very articulate, very competitive guy, but I don't think the urgency was there. And I think when you look at the rest of the receiving room, like with Zacchaeus and Luke McCaffrey and Deami Brown, and there's it's a different tempo and a different physicality there. And so if you've identified someone that doesn't necessarily fit your cultural identity, and I think I always look back at what San Francisco was in 2017 and the decisions that they made 
in 17 to kind of build that roster out. And now they're one of the toughest teams in the NFL. You don't become one of the toughest teams in the NFL by practicing tough. You bring in tough people. And I think that's where kind of maybe the disconnect was for him. And not, and again, not that Jahan's not tough, but he didn't always play with that, that physicality. And so I think they just said, Hey, you know, this, you're a good football player. We respect what you do, but it's not the right fit for us. And so they moved on from him. And, um, and again, like that puts them in a little bit of a situation now, but I think ultimately in the long term, it's going to be advantageous for them because again, they're looking for a certain type of athlete competitor and physicality that they felt Jahan was not that. So fair enough. All right, let's get to the defense. Um, I joked to somebody, I, I watched the uh, TV show, big brother. I'm ashamed to admit it, but it's a fact. <laughs> and you know, these people are trapped in this, fake house for weeks on end and when they come out they have no idea like you know like for example like they were talking the night after the presidential debate uh i i don't even know do they even i'm not sure i think they know that joe biden dropped out but they will know about the debate like they, they don't know about anything who, who who got hurt anything if i had been put somebody in the big brother house the day after the day the day the, the regular season ended the last regular season ended and then you just came out and watched this game you might think wait i thought ron rivera was getting fired because the defense looked very similar. It was a lot of the same mistakes that we saw before in terms of this inability. The, 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 the secondary looked out of sync. You know, the pass rush, it was some some decent moments, but they couldn't get the sacks. It felt very reminiscent of before, despite the fact that it's all new staff, most of the players, et cetera. Did you feel any of that deja vu? Or for you, was it all just coincidence and very different? Uh, no, I didn't feel that really. I, th I think, I think part of it is when you're, you're watching it, when you're watching the film, when you're watching, uh, you know, watching all the film last year, that defense compared to this year, like they were doing stuff more purposefully than this year, I will say like they just, you could tell there's a, a different standard, you know, like there's a different standard when it comes to pass rush, there's a different standard when it comes to coverage. And, uh, and again, there were mistakes that were made and it wasn't overly consistent, but like, it's different. And I, and I think that's something like much like Jaden Daniels, you know, we talked about some of his inconsistencies in terms of seeing, in terms of seeing the defense. I feel the same way about the defense on this side of the ball. I think they are, they got a bunch of young guys playing together for the first time. And this is NFL football. It's a very good Tampa Bay defense uh, offense. I'm very good. maybe a little bit strong, but a good Tampa Bay team. And that offense is very complicated, lots of motions and shifts. They're going to test your rules. And this is a tough outing. Like for Mike Sanders, still tough outing. Quan Martin, second year player, tough outing. Emmanuel Forbes, I'll put in that same bucket. I think he he had some different issues, but I think the mental kind of strain that was put on those guys was very, very high. And I look at the way Benjamin St. Juice competed this year in this game. And again, it's one game. And I thought to myself, like, this is a different player. You know what I mean? Just in terms of how physically aggressive he was with one of the maybe best big body receivers in the NFL. And so to me, it's different. Again, they have issues they're going to go through. They have, uh, you know, corrections that need to be made. They have learning experiences that need to be kind of learning journeys that need to be embarked on. But it, it, in terms of the comparison, like when you watch the product on the field, it's different. And again, I think as, as those young players play together more specifically in the back end, I think you're going to see a much better result and a overall more consistent product. I think that's one thing that I just like kind of is a, a little bit of a pet peeve for me. It's like, this is the first game these guys have played together. You know, like we don't talk about the preseason, talk about joint practice. It's the first game and uh, it's different. It's just a different thing. And they're going to figure it out. I'm very confident. Like hearing some of, again, like you're, like I mentioned, I was a wallflower on the sideline. Mm -hmm. Hearing some of the corrections being made by those defensive backs coaches, I was like, this is different. This is a different thing that, that, that this defense is trying to build here. And, um, that's really exciting for me, but again, it's going to take some time to kind of to learn it, I think, and, and make sure that all these young football players are on the same page. After the game, I asked Dan Quinn, I said, look, I don't think you're guys, you're, you're the kind of guy that's going to make excuses that said more than half the roster is new. Some of your defensive players didn't play at all in the preseason. The ones that did at most were like, you know, three series over three games. It seems reasonable to think that it's therefore there's going to be some fits and stops with what's going on in week one. Is that reasonable? He's like, no, no, I thought we were pretty good in our preparation. He did say though, however, that he was a little surprised about the energy level thought there would be more aggressiveness out there. And I think he's primarily talking about the defense. I'm, I'm assuming. Um, did you, were you kind of on that aspect? Like 
is there re- is it reasonable to say, hey, look, they didn't do a lot in the preseason, therefore it's reasonable to think they may be a little bit slower coming out of the gate on defense? Does that seem reasonable? You know, I've I've been I've done it both ways. I've uh I've never personally done it both ways because I usually play in all the preseason games. But from my experience playing with different yeah. teams, there were teams where the coaches really coddled guys through the preseason, and they came out like absolute maniacs because they were just frothing at the mouth for contact. Like they just were so fresh and so excited for it that they were just like rabid dogs. It's also gone the other way where I've seen guys get coddled a little bit, and it's taken them, you know two, three games to kind of get their legs under them. So uh, I think based on how they played in the preseason, I would have said they would have come out with the appropriate juice. And and that's one thing Dan is always, you know, when I played for him in Atlanta, that was something he always emphasized. It's just like, where's your energy? Where's your passion for the game and for your teammates? And so again, when you're building a new culture, that's not something that happens overnight. So I think he, I'm not, I don't want to put words in his mouth. This is an assumption on my part. I think he just was hoping for more of that. Because you can always have more of positive energy, right? That's that old football adage, like you control your attitude and your effort. Like those are two things that you have total control over in the game. Everything else is a little bit superfluous. So I think I think that's maybe what he's calling attention to. I didn't think anybody didn't play hard or didn't try their best. I didn't see that. But I definitely understand that perspective from Dan because I think that's something he really emphasizes. And, it, and it's probably a little bit frustrating when it's not at 100%. Well, and I think... Anybody who has played sports at any level, even if they weren't fortunate enough to play in the NFL like you, like the better you are, the more comfortable you are with what is about, was it, what is happening, the less, the more instinctive you become and the less thinking you become. And it definitely looked like in the secondary in particular, a group that was thinking a lot. There was these various breakdowns on, um, you know, a lot of plays. I mean, Baker Mayfield missed a few throws early. Otherwise it could have gotten out of hand uh, quick, uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm in my head. I'm thinking, okay, because I kind of felt what what he was saying, but not that they, they weren't trying, but that there was a lot of overthinking, perhaps. Yes, and again, that sure. was the miscommunication. Is that that miscommunication in general in the secondary? Like you said, these guys the first time they play together, was that part of maybe what was going on? Yeah, part of it. I mean, one of those in, in the early, uh, in the early, in the I think it was the first quarter where they missed that wheel route to number. 15 uh for tampa bay like they're in empty so they're trying to check to what what appears to be cover two so you get half the field in cover two and then the other half didn't get the check and so you know obviously you get some guys playing two some guys playing man like that's when the bullets i've seen them do that probably 20 times in training camp it's empty we're gonna check the two boom get out of here right but they didn't right? They didn't do it. They didn't get it communicated. There's something different about when the bullets are real and when it's live. And when that team on the other side has executed this play, you know, for a couple of years now, because that, that roster has been together for a while. So right. then there's the other play where they motion to a bunch and b- bunches are always really crazy for man rules, right? So, you know, you got, I've got the first guy out, I've got the first guy vertical, I've got the first guy in. And then they run a little bit of a concept, nothing too crazy, but a spot concept where there's a sit and a corner. And it looks like they get confused on who's the first guy in and who's the first guy deep. So I, that's stuff that's going to get corrected as they go, right? It, it just is, right? There's defensive back leverages, right? You can tell, I mean, London Fletcher is so, you, if you guys have an opportunity, you should definitely li- listen to the game broadcast because his defensive insight is so spectacular. I feel like I'm learning something every single time we're on there, but he's talking about defensive back leverages and how they're not playing the correct leverages all the time. And then when I walk by the sideline, I hear coaches yelling leverage. I'm like, man, flesh must've been onto something there. Right. So that's stuff that will get corrected. And I think the thing that's encouraging is last year, there was no talk of leverages in certain situations, right? It was just kind of like, go out and good luck, like have fun. And so I do think that there is a path where like this gets better very quickly as the guys get um, more comfortable with these, these, again, these are novel looks. I think that's the other thing fancy to understand, like playing defense is all about what you've seen, right? What you've seen and how you adjust to certain things. And so, I mean, credit to Tampa Bay, man, they came out with the, with the kitchen sink. They were, they had some very kind of specific game plan runs. They had some very specific game plan concepts that were going to test these rules and man to man coverage And again, like I talked to Fred Smoot about it. And one of the things he always says is like, when you play together with a bunch of guys for a long time, like him and Sean Springs, him and Sean Taylor, uh, they played together for a long time. They could just kind of figure stuff out in game. And this group isn't there yet. And it's going to take a couple of weeks to get there, maybe even half the season. So I just think that's important to keep in mind. Like they made mistakes. 
but I, you kind of expect the mistakes. And I think that's something that's part of the growing process with the defense. I don't think they're bad football players. I think it's just about, again, I, this is a, an old thing that Kyle used to say to us all the time. It takes three years to learn an offense. And what did he mean by that? It doesn't take three years to learn what's in the book. It makes three years to learn like, oh, on this one, I got to be a little bit wider with my split. Or on this run, I got to get back off the ball so I can cut this out. And if I don't do that, I'm not optimizing myself. I think it's probably very similar for defense. It's the it's the stuff that's not on the page that they're still learning at this point. It's the Malcolm Gladwell, you know, 10,000 hours deal. It's yes, not, yeah, like you said, it's 100%. not understanding where I have to run. It's understanding the nuances of that makes it better and then to stop thinking and and all that. Um, 100%. By the way, I like, you, 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 you're you doing really good today. You just named the 2023, you put a caption on the 2023 season. Good luck, have fun. I like that. That, that, that's, that, that, <laughs> that's what basically it was all about last year. Okay. Um, one last thing on the defense, and then I want to get to a couple, couple of quick things and let you get back to life. Um, the Dan Quinn said that he thought he was pleased with the pass rush, but not with the finishes. Like, you know, if you look yeah. at some of the stats, according to I think PFF, Deron Payne had five hurries, John Allen had two, but they didn't have like any quarterback hits, let alone sacks. And this was a lot of what happened last year, it felt like as well what did you see were you hope were you optimistic with what you saw out of the pass rush and obviously it's very this is you know very new with with the way they're going to bring some guys around you know get Luvu in there all that stuff where were you on the on the pass rush because if the pass rush isn't more effective a secondary is going to have a long year yeah I think that's a great point that's something again it's it's there needs to be an urgency to get that better but I what I will say is like again you asked me oh does this feel like is this the same film as 2023 and I can definitively say no, specifically in this category. And what I mean by that is like last year, the team would get pressures. They get five pressures a game or whatever, but they weren't affecting the quarterback type of pressures. They're, they're, they're compressing the pocket, which does, which, it, which makes it tough for quarterbacks to scramble and move around, but they're not moving him off the spot. And I just, I was really impressed with the plan from a pass rush standpoint and how they were able to get guys on different angles on different pass protectors, looping people. And then again, Baker Mayfield's got to move around. He's got to navigate the rush in a way that, I mean, you watched the games last year, Ben. I don't remember seeing that. I remember seeing that maybe three times the whole year and they were all against the the Denver Broncos in week two or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like it, yeah. it wasn't a very common thing. And so to see that six times, seven times in a game, I'm very encouraged by that. And absolutely, you have to finish. Absolutely. That's that's why you get paid the big bucks, right? Is to take those pressures and turn them into sacks. Because if you get a sack on second to 10, it's third and 18. You win that down. And we're not even talking about some of these explosive plays. Like they end drives. They keep points off the board. And so, again, I was really impressed. You got to be better. We got to finish. No doubt about it. Got to finish. But in terms of scheme, in terms of the physical execution, I thought it was there in in the sense that like the it's elevating what they're doing on a down to down basis. And that's encouraging to me because those are five pressures that we wouldn't have had last year as a team. And so that's got to grow. That's got to improve hundred percent. And I emphatically agree with coach finish like three of those. And we're this, the game, the complexion of this game is totally different because sacks are explosive plays for the defense, right? They, they put the offense exactly where they don't want to be second and long, third and long, the playbook gets to, I'm not kidding you, it gets to about five plays in those situations. And if I know those five plays, I've seen them and I understand the weaknesses of my defense, we can defend that and we can get you off the field. So uh, I, again, I was really impressed with some of the schematics, some of, again, some of the physical execution stuff, great pass rush by Duran, great pass rush by John, you know, Luvu did some good stuff. Um, Bobby Wagner had an excellent bliss where he's collapsing the pocket into the quarterback. Awesome. But Let's finish some of those and and put us in a good spot to to win that football game. All right, a uh, couple of quick uh, fact or fiction questions for you. You can uh, answer them as short or as long as you want. <laughs> um, all right, fact or fiction. Despite not playing in the game, Noah Brown is one of their three best wide receivers, or needs to be for the rest of the season. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I think that is still to be determined. I think. People are fans, especially they go and they say, oh, he's 6'2", he's 215 pounds. He's definitely the number two guy. When you watch him in Houston, like he's a good football player. He had, I think he had 40 receptions for like 500 or 600 yards last year, whatever the number is. 
like OZ did that exact same thing in 2022 in Philly, like almost identical. So there are limitations to what he does in the same way. There's limitations to what OZ does. I think maybe what it gives you is a guy that's got a lot of playing experience that can help you bump OZ into the slot. So from that standpoint, to be one of your top three, I think it would significantly help this group, but I think it still remains to be seen. He's a guy that didn't play a lot of football last year because of injury or he played a fair enough, but season shorted because of injury didn't do the off season because of injury. So He's got some things to prove to to this staff. But in terms of play style, like when you watch him last year in Houston, he's extremely physical. He blocks his face off. He's urgent. He runs routes hard. So he definitely fits the mold. Um, so what I'll say is I'll say true if, for them to be, a, to, to be a much improved offense. If he's a top three guy and can play that way, it's going to really help this group out for sure. Yeah, I, I just look. I mean, look, he got cut by Houston. It's not. Let's not pretend like they were. You yeah. know, he's not some, some all pro. But at the same point, between his size, he's known for his blocking, and that there were at least points last year, fantasy players remember, where he was explosive as a playmaker. That's maybe at least two aspects that he can do. Whereas like other guys, it's like it feels like they're sort of limited in like one bucket. That yeah. and, and the fact that if they want to run more or have the two running backs out there, having a physical presence out there, like Diami is willing to block, but he's not that big. So having a guy like that out there uh, in Noah Brown feels like it could be advantageous for what they want to do, but also to make up for some limits elsewhere. All right, staying at the receiver. Uh, fact or fiction, the coaching staff already sees Luke McCaffrey as the second best receiver behind Terry. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say right now, you're saying, what is it? Today is... Sure. Well, Thursday, Wednesday. I mean, he played I'm the second saying, most snaps just, just over Diami, but that was slightly surprising to me considering he wasn't being used, as right. I recall, with the first team that often in training him. I'm going to say not yet, but it's very, very close. Like he's it, he's not the second best receiver yet on the team, but I do think there is a, a, a lot of growth potential for him. And when you watch him, when you watch how he played, when you watch how he runs routes, you're like, this guy could be really impactful here. You know, I'm not saying he's going to have – 100 catches but he might be a guy that ends up surprising us with 40 or 50 catches and is a, just a super solid kind of have his very solid to, to above average rookie season so i don't think he's there yet but i think in the next probably i'd say three or four weeks maybe five weeks we're looking at him as the definitively the number two guy him maybe uh noah brown kind of in that mix together so okay fact or fiction brandon coleman should start at left tackle this week yeah, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say yeah. I think that's true. I think when you look at I think Cornelius Lucas did a great job in pass protection. I think he I think Cornelius again. This is one of his limitations as a player. Like he's really good in pass pro. He's a little bit limited as a run blocker. And I think when Brandon Coleman's in there, he gives you a little bit more oomph, a little bit more athleticism to get to the second level to you know reach those shades, be a little bit more dynamic. Um, and I think this week might not be a bad week for him to start. Obviously, the pass rushers. I think for um, the Giants are a little bit, at least on paper, or kind of their reputation is better. Um, but I, I think uh, I think their defense is a little bit simpler in terms of the blitzes that they're going to bring. And I think it might not be a bad way to get him in and get his feet wet. But I do think – I think he'll – you know, if it's not this week, I definitely think it's in the next three weeks that he's going to be starting at left tackle for this team. Um, this is a, 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 a so an add-on to that question. If that's the case, we have not talked much this year about the idea of, okay, well, if Coleman does start – does that mean Lucas should be considered to be at right tackle? It looked to me like Andrew Wiley was giving up some inside pressure a little bit early in the game. Obviously, the, the they didn't give up a ton of pressure in general or sacks, and but Tampa Bay was also missing a couple of their key linemen. If Coleman starts a left tackle, would you put Col would you put Lucas at right or stay with Wiley? I think Wiley. Okay, this is a, this is tough because I think fans understand all pressures are not created equal for the offensive line. So he gave up two, I think he gave up four pressures in the game, right? I think two of them, if I, I might be off, just he gave up three or four. Yeah. Two of them to my eye were off of stunts. So basically what they were doing, and this is, they were really well executed by Tampa Bay. They were having like Yaya Diaby or the edge rusher attack the inside shoulder of Wiley. And it looks like an inside move. But basically what's happening is the guard and the tackle are on different levels because the three technique is looping around. So it looks like that's Wiley's fault, but it's actually like Cosme and Wiley's fault. And they need to make sure that they're on the same level. And it's and it's a little bit hard for both of those guys because of how they were running the stunt. So I just wanted to kind of call attention to that. So I think Wiley's athleticism is very advantageous to this offense. 
obviously if the inside move thing continues to be an issue Lucas would be a great addition there at left tackle or right tackle excuse me but I think the the what he brings in the running game from a leverage standpoint from the ability to bend standpoint dig people out on double teams to reach the front side defensive end is going to be really advantageous moving forward like he's just he's a people sleep on his athleticism but he's a very kind of twitched up moves really well type of guy and I think that's what they're looking for and I think ultimately that's why Lucas is is back to the swing rotation because they're looking for better athletes at those spots okay uh fact or fiction Okay, fact. Okay, we talked about the secondary factor fiction. The despite whatever promise may exist with these cornerbacks, they should go out and spend some money to bring in a veteran corner now to help this group. My question to you would be, why? Why would they do that? Well, I guess then this is. The, I mean, like if you're optimistic, if they're optimistic the way you sounded to be in terms of like, hey, it's week one, they hadn't played together. Let's see. Cool. But on the other hand, for the people like uh, most of us who are watching it in, in without forgetting what happened in last year, it looks like on paper, Emmanuel Forbes is getting picked on again. By the way, I thought Forbes had a really, he, he uh, in, ter- in terms of growth, he early in the game, he really stuck his uh, head in there on a, I don't mean that bad tackling form, but like, he really stuck his nose in there on a run play that I don't think he would have made done a year ago. So uh, I thought that was some, that was a sign of some growth, but I don't know, like, but, yeah, so what I would but say like Mike is Davis, like, like Mike Davis didn't play one defensive snap, and that's the guy that they brought in, and everybody else is either young or kind of random. So that's why that's kind of why I'm asking. Yeah, so what I'd say is, I mean, obviously, if the price is right, you do it. But I think the thing that I would just kind of call it, like this is a, I'm going to say retooling year because the rebuild word is something that people are kind of trying to shy away from. There, I don't think anyone's expecting them to go to the Super Bowl this year. So what this would allow us to do is determine who of these young guys we want to want well, part of the organization moving forward. And obviously if it gets really bad, like where we can't play defense, then yeah, you got to bring somebody in. But I think this is like, this is part of the deal is you are going to get young football players, the opportunity to show affirmatively or in the negative that they can do this. And so like part of that is letting them play. And so I don't know if there's an advantage to bring in a veteran who is not going to be part of the solution long-term, at least right now. Like, obviously, like I said, if like maybe by a week, you know, 10, it's like, man, like we really can't, we can't do defense anymore because of X, Y, Z. Yeah. Let's bring somebody in and let's make sure we can do, we can, we can get an evaluation on the rest of the group. Um, But I I think right now I want to know, like, I want to know Forbes, are you part of the solution or are you, are you not part of the solution? Um, You know, no big monogamy. Are you going to be a nickel guy for us moving forward? Like Mike Sanders, are you going to play outside? Like what's going on? So let's let those guys play some football. And like I said, if it gets crazy, we'll we'll make an adjustment. But you yeah, look at you, you're coming for Bram's job, the perfect pronunciation of uh, Noah Igbenagi. I can't I can't do it. <laughs> um, that's great. And you basically lead into my last point. And I won't even make it a fact or fiction. But I've been saying for months, and I don't think people want to hear it enough, especially certain fans, which I get. But even honestly, some media people too. They are not. My view has been they are not. Anything they've done has not been about this season. It has been about what they're building. It's why the brand and I, the idea of a brand and I trade made zero sense. Right. People keep yelling at me that you're not going to give up picks and pay this guy a ton of money for a team that is realistically not being built to win this year. Now that's again, that's well, I'm not saying they're not tanking. This isn't that it's just, they're playing the long game. That's why they signed a lot of guys to one year contracts. They didn't go out and sign guys to big contracts. And yeah. So while I do wonder about maybe adding some corner help, especially if again, Mike Davis isn't even going to be a factor and Noah has never been, you know, this is year four yeah. or five for him and it's not happened. Um, but that, but yes, this is, this year is about building. It is not about, going for it if, if it ha- if it works out fine but i think this is the thing that still people are going to struggle to wrap their head around especially if god forbid for fans they lose to the giants and start staring oh and six in the face and being like oh no what's going on here yeah i definitely don't think the team is there i think this team is going to be an ascending team as the year goes on because like some of these questions that we have now like are going to be answered like this guy can't do it this guy can do it this guy's doing a better job than we thought Right. So I don't think they're, again, they're not tanking, but I do think you got to think of this as like, how do I build the best team? Um, how do I build the best team long term? 
because ultimately that's the goal, right? Look, I, I, again, I go back to San Francisco because they're the most, they're the best model of this, right? They were not very good in 17 and 18. Like they were, I think it was a five win team. I think they were a four win team. They were talking about Kyle Shanahan getting fired, right? It was like, oh no, what's going on? And then in, um, in 19, they went to the Super Bowl, right? Like that, that's kind of the trajectory we're looking for. You got to get an influx of talent, an influx of the right people. And the great thing is, is I think that they have the quarterback situation worked out. So it's just about now, you know, how do we, who, who is going to be here long-term, who's not, and then how, what do we need to make sure we invest this off season, whether it's, whether it's with the draft or through free agency. So I think that's what, what needs to be looked at again. This, this team is not, they're not last year's team. I don't think they're going to go four and 12 or whatever, four and 13. It's, it's a team that I think is, um, they, they have some questions that need to be answered. And I think that's what they're going to be doing over the next, you know, 16 weeks. Yeah. It's amazing how people forget the past. I mean, not the, you know, the Troy Aikman Dallas Cowboys, his rookie year. He, he as a starter, he's zero and 11. They finished one in 15. Yeah. Ironically, the one win was against a really good Washington team. <laughs> and then a few years later, they're the class of the league the for several year. And you know, that, Nobody wants to go through this, but th this is kind of what Dan Quinn was saying the other day. You don't want to go through this, but sometimes this is what you have to do. And I just think people would have a much easier time this season. Not that you want to root for, not to accept losing, but if you accept where this is, and I do think they're making the right moves, et cetera, that it'll make this development year feel better. If you're viewing this as, hey, make the playoffs, I think you're going to be disappointed and, and unfairly so to what they're actually doing. That would be my basic. Yeah, I think, I think for me too, it's kind of that it's just like where can this roster grow how does the quarterback grow how does coleman grow how do how does luke mccaffrey grow like how does uh, is jeremy chin the guy at safety is bobby wagner still got stuff left in the tank like these are the things that you're watching for and if those are all answered in the affirmative that's excellent for this team and that is a win a definitive win for this organization and so like i'm not again i've never been a win loss guy i've been all about the process right and if they and if they if they get some of that stuff cleaned up in the back end, if the quarterback starts making some of these throws, like this team's gonna be fine. They're gonna be fine. They might not go to the playoffs this year, but they are definitely setting the stage for something big the following year or the year after that. So again, I don't think they're tanking. I don't think they're trying to lose games. I just think you got to be realistic about where the roster's at, where the young quarterback's at. It's a new quarterback, new coordinator. New defensive, everything's new. It takes time to kind of flush stuff out. And th that that's all part of this process of of making sure we've got the best commanders team. A team, I think, you know, uh, Josh Harris said it. It's like, it's easy to get to eight and eight. eight, and eight. Yeah. They could easily get to eight in this year, eight, right? They'd sign a cornerback. They sign a free agent. Offensive they did lineman. it the last four years. I mean, not, not last year, but they were four and five even when they fell apart at the end. Like, that, yeah, you can get the 500. Right. That's not complicated. But it, I want I want to be talking on this podcast with you in two years about how they're going to the Super Bowl. Like that's what I want, and that's what fans should also want. I think, and I think that's what every every decision they've made so far to me has been the right one. And this is part of those decisions, and I support that one hundred percent. Look, this is why I keep bringing you back here, I, and I'm saying this. Is, I'll say this sincerely, not fucking around. Sorry, Bram. I don't know if I'm allowed to curse. Uh, <laughs> Bram, get him. Okay. <laughs> But, um, you know, Lo Logan is, he's on the broadcast. Like, it would be easy for him to say, everything is sunshine, everything's great, they're playing our, no, I mean, you got to be realistic about where this is, because if you're not, I think you're just setting yourself up for failure in terms of what is actually going to happen, and I think you did that, and that's why, Logan, you know, you, uh, you know, I'm always willing to be your huckleberry when it comes to discussing <laughs> discussing the uh, commanders. All right, uh, the Take Command podcast with Craig Hoffman on on the Odyssey uh, app, uh, all that. Obviously, tons of stuff with the team, both in terms of the weekly broadcast, but also on the website, always breaking down this team with, with Fred Smoot, Santana Moss, and others. Anything else we need to uh, promote uh, yeah, uh, your busy lifestyle? And just make sure we're checking out that uh, that radio call, man. I think London Fletcher and Bram do such a great job on that thing. So if you you know turn the volume down on your TV, turn the turn the radio up, and let uh, let a Washington legend, a Hall of Famer, like guide you on your journey. Because I I'm telling you, I know a lot about football, but I learn something every time that man talks. So uh, I definitely think if you are a Washington fan, that's the way you need to be approaching those uh, those games now. All right, I forgot to ask the important question: What SPF level are you wearing on the sidelines uh, now that you're uh, out, out, exposed? 
it's the highest level that they have available. I'm <laughs> I'm pretty I'm pretty pasty, Bram. I gotta, I gotta not Bram. Bram, Ben, excuse me. Wow. I gotta I gotta make sure I'm taking care of my skin. So yeah. All right. You rule. I appreciate it. Uh we'll uh we'll talk. I'll see you out there in, in Ashburn. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. All right. Once again, big thanks to Logan Paulson uh, for that. Uh, I always enjoy talking to Logan. It ends up always running along, and that uh, we decided to break it up into two parts. So I uh, hope that worked out for all. I enjoyed the chat for sure. Um, so like I said, we've got to figure out with Washington what's going to happen here with Forbes. What does this mean for the roster, the rotation? And, you know, Bob, most of all, you know, Jaden Daniels, where does he go from here, where does uh, how does this team help him stay on track, improve against the Giants, who have a very talented defensive line uh, led by defensive tackle Dexter Lawrence, who Cliff Kingsbury today said in a post Aaron Donald world, Lawrence is other along with Max Crosby with the Raiders and Chris Jones with the Chiefs, the most disruptive lineman in the league. So I don't I think that's a reasonable view, and I think for Washington to harass Daniel Jones and not have him be, as we've seen too many times, be a sort of a Superman against Washington. The commanders are going to need their guys in the middle, Deron Payne and Jonathan Allen, to be uh, more effective than they were in the last game. They were fine, but they just didn't get any sacks. Washington only had one, and, um, you know, that's what they're going to need not only to beat the Giants, but also to just, you know, help this defense Overall, for what it's worth, while Daniel Jones has been very good against Washington, in the three years with Dan Quinn as the Cowboys defensive coordinator, he was the Giants were 0-6 against Dallas and 0-4 in the games started by Jones, who had one touchdown and three interceptions in those games. So whatever Dan Quinn was doing was working better. Of course, he also had a different personnel, Micah Parsons and so on. So... Uh, Tactics are one thing, personnel is another. We'll see if he can get his plan that has worked to uh, vibe with the team he has here in Washington. All right, that is going to be it now. If you're going out to the game on Sunday at Northwest Stadium, enjoy it. A season opener is always fun. Uh, if you're out there, you know, if you somehow, uh, you know, you see me floating around, say hello. Definitely appreciate that. Send me your. Uh, your game day picks on Twitter, again, at Ben Standick. If you want to email me, bstandick at theathletic.com. That works as well. But that is it for now. Um, ben Standick signing off. Until next time. See ya.